Today I want you to meet Obese and Lean. These two guys are pretty much identical. They have the same age and they have been exposed to the exact same experimental conditions since they were born. Their genetic makeup is also very similar, except for one thing. Obese lacks a receptor for leptin, a hormone secreted by the adipose tissue which signals satiety. As a result of this little genetic defect, obese is always hungry, and while it has always been given the same amount of food as his friend Lean, Lean would stop eating after a while, while obese would keep going until its food was over. If I offer a pellet of food to Lean, he is only marginally interested, but if I offer it to obese, well, as a result of this impaired satiety reflex, and only because of that, already after two or three weeks of life, obese became, well, obese. Today, at four months of age, Lean weighs in at 350 grams, while obese weighs more than 670. Hunger and satiety are crucial regulatory mechanisms that greatly contribute to maintaining a healthy body weight or to disrupt it if something goes wrong. The Hunger and Satiety Center is located in our brain and specifically in the paraventricular nucleus of our hypothalamus, although other regions of our brain are also involved in this regulatory activity. Our brain integrates short and long-term biological and psychosocial signals that influence our eating behavior and our metabolism. Hunger and appetite are our go signals for eating, while satiation and satiety are stop signals. Hunger is a strictly biological signal. It is defined as our biological drive to eat, and it is controlled by our internal hunger and satiety mechanisms. A group of chemicals in our brain, called orexins, are released when our bloodstream, our digestive system, and our energy stores send signals that it's time to eat because we are beginning to run out of energy and nutrients. The main orexin is the neuropeptide Y, a neurotransmitter that relays the signals to eat more, causing hunger. Conversely, when our bloodstream, our digestive system, and our energy stores send signals that we still have plenty of nutrients, anorexigenic chemicals are produced in our brain, such as alpha-melanotropin, a hormone which does the exact opposite of the MPY, and relays the signal that we do not need to eat, causing satiety. What we eat, how much we eat, when we eat, where we eat, and why we eat is what we call our eating behavior. As we will learn, eating behavior is determined biologically, but also psychologically and socially. If hunger is a strictly biological signal, appetite is the psychosocial drive to eat, mainly controlled by external influences, which we will explore more in detail in the next lesson. Of course, appetite is also mediated by biological signals, such as the release of endorphins, our brain's pleasure molecules. Let's now examine our stop eating signals. Satiation is the perception of fullness that develops during a meal and determines its duration. These short-term end-of-meal signals are both psychological, mechanical, and hormonal. The main psychological signal is our perception of the amount of food we have been eating. And as we will learn, our brain mainly takes into account the volume of food and the number of servings, and not so much the caloric density or the nutrient content. The main mechanical signal is the distension of the walls of our stomach and intestine caused by the presence of food. Two important hormonal signals are the release of cholecystokinin, CCK, and of PYY336 that our intestine releases into our bloodstream at the passage of food. By inhibiting release of neuropeptide Y in our brain, these signals reduce hunger. While satiation is a short-term feeling that develops during the meal, satiety is the perception of fullness after the meal has ended and it determines the interval between two meals. Sensors in our brain and liver constantly monitor blood glucose and insulin levels, and when these are low, our liver starts gluconeogenesis to make some new glucose and our brain induces hunger to get some more from food. Other sensors in our digestive tract constantly monitor stomach and intestinal filling, and when these are empty, our stomach releases the hormone ghrelin, which induces hunger by promoting release of neuropeptide Y in our brain.
the nutrient composition of the food we eat influences our hunger and satiety signals. Some nutrients are more satiating in the short term, while others have more of a long-term effect. For example, fiber strongly induces satiation, but it is very weak on satiety. If we only eat a salad, it will fill us up quickly, but we will be hungry again soon. In contrast, lipids have a weak effect on satiation, but a strong effect on satiety. If we only eat a high-fat food for lunch, such as nuts, by the time we feel full, we have already eaten much more calories than we need. But at least we will not be hungry again for quite a while. Carbohydrates are not very satiating. They have a medium effect on satiation and a weak effect on satiety. Finally, proteins have the stronger satiating effect of all nutrients because they are strongly induced both short-term satiation and longer-term satiety. We also have signals that operate in the longer term to regulate hunger and satiety, and a very important one is leptin. Leptin is a hormone secreted primarily by our adipose tissue, and it targets the brain to decrease hunger. Our brain, however, is much more sensitive to variations in leptin concentrations, providing for a very smart homeostatic mechanism. When we overeat over the long term, and our adipose tissue grows, our leptin concentrations increase, which causes our hunger to decrease. Conversely, when we start losing adipose tissue and therefore our leptin levels drop, our brain gets the message that we better start eating a little bit more, and our hunger increases. While this system works very well to protect us from undereating, as many people on weight loss diets can witness, it is unfortunately not so efficient the other way around. In fact, obese people who have a lot of adipose tissue also have a lot of leptin around, but this has no effect on their hunger because when it is overexposed to leptin, our brain quickly becomes insensitive to it, a situation called leptin resistance. Besides not doing anything useful, all this circulating leptin in obese individuals is actually harmful because leptin is a pro-inflammatory molecule. As you can easily understand, giving supplemental leptin to obese people has no effect whatsoever on their hunger, except for a very small percentage of obese individuals who became obese precisely because they lack leptin, like our friend obese. Another kind of stop-eating signal is specific satiety, which mostly determines the composition of our meal rather than its duration. Specific satiety is the perception of fullness that develops during consumption of one food item in particular. As we keep eating one specific food, its palatability decreases until we feel full for that specific food, although we still have appetite for other foods. If I start eating carrots, after a while I'll be like, that's enough. If I see one more carrot, it will make me sick. But if they offer me a slice of cheesecake, chances are I still have an appetite for it. This is a very important physiological mechanism to induce variety in our diet, and therefore maximize our chance of getting all the nutrients we need from different foods. It is also used as a little trick by many popular weight loss diets that do not restrict the amount, but the variety of food items we can eat. If we can eat unlimited amounts, but only of cabbage soup, we soon get bored and end up eating less calories anyways. Our biological regulation of eating behavior is very effective in protecting us from undereating, but it is very weak against overconsumption. Don't forget that the human body is evolutionarily programmed to accumulate, and it is much less concerned with avoiding excess food. And as we learned today, biologically we only regulate hunger, but eating behavior is also strongly driven by psychosocial factors that determine appetite. We will explore some of these factors over the next few lessons.